you know, in our lives, um, we're oftentimes a lot like an iceberg. In fact, we've got a picture of an iceberg. We've got about, I don't know, about 10% of the iceberg that's visible. And you guys have probably heard about this before. Not every iceberg is like this, but oftentimes the, the greater mass of the iceberg is below the waterline. And, and that's what sailors say you got to be careful of. You don't know what's lurking. You know, it seems like it's pretty small, but you never know what might be out there uh, able to gouge a ho hole in, uh, in your boat. And so one of the things that, that really represent us in this is oftentimes we just want to show our best 10%, right? When I, when I enter like this space, I want you to think of me as a pastor who's always loving, always kind, always encouraging, always energetic. That's the 10% above the waterline. But we all know there's other things going below the waterline in our hearts, right? There's things that we struggle with. There's temptation. There's fear. There's oftentimes depression and anxiety that just lurks underneath the, the surface of that waterline that if we're not careful, that's actually what can cause the greatest damage in our heart, the greatest damage in our life, and the lives of other people. In fact, what I'd like you to do as we, as we move into today's study is I want you to all just to come up with one, one temptation that you struggle with. Not a temptation that you struggled with 10 years ago, but one temptation that you're struggling with right now, maybe this week, maybe even today. If you want, you can come up with 10. Some of you are like, I, I think I can come up with probably about 100. Just one. That's all we're after. Let me kind of prime the pump a little bit. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's overeating. You know, you, you, just, you just love sugar, right? And, and it calls your name at weird times. Middle of the night, you were sound asleep, but now it's like, I got to get a tub of ice cream and just enjoy the sweet stuff. Um, some of you, it's not, it's, not, it's not overeating. Maybe it's overspending. Uh, you convince yourself that you will actually save money because it's on sale. I'll save money by spending money, even though you don't really need what's on sale. And for you, you know, temptation isn't at the tracks. It's not in the casino. It's not the nightclub. It's not in the bars. For you, you know where temptation is? It's at the clearance rack. I mean, that's where you start spending money you don't really have on stuff you really don't need. And then maybe for others of you, it's, it's a substance you know we, know, we all know of drug addiction, and so maybe your temptation comes in the form of a glass bottle, or at least what's inside the bottle, or a pill, or something you smoke, or something that you chew, and it's just, it's got a hold of you, and it has so much power, it, you seem to be powerless against it. Still, others of you, it, it's, not, it's not that, it's not that you have a uh, temptation for substance. For you, you just have this need to control the world around you. And when things aren't going exactly the way you want, exactly how you wanted it to go, you just feel so off balance. You feel so off balance that you need to actually, you need to control the people around you. And besides, you've got brilliant ideas. I mean, your ideas are better than the ideas of those around you. And so what do you do? You try to convince, right? You try to coerce. You try to ultimately control the outcomes. And in the meantime, you're living the best life ever, but everyone around you just thinks you're a massive jerk. Um, maybe it's not, maybe it's not that you want to control, but you have a temptation to be really critical. Like you have turned criticism into an art form. You can pick anyone or anything apart and maybe you're doing it right now with the service that you've already got a list of 17 things you don't really like, you don't really care for. And we've just started the service and you're thinking, yep, me too. I'm going to, I'm going to end with like a cool hundred things that I'm very critical of. And then there might be others of you who you're not, you're not, you're not dealing with anything. You know, you're, you, you've grown in your Christian maturity to a point where, well, gosh, it's really difficult. Maybe you could, maybe you could stretch it and find at least one thing, maybe, but I, I really think I've, I've mastered these things. If that's you, what I want you to do is I want you to turn to the person next to you and I want you to whisper in their ear, even if you came with them or not, right? Whisper to them, say, I struggle with Pride. Go ahead, because that's what it is. Like, we all have temptation. We all struggle. And this is something that Jesus wants to address. Why are we doing this little exercise? Because Jesus, in his prayer, he's going to, he's going to encourage us to realize that our world is full of temptation. It's got an enemy. There is sin, and there is evil present. And if we're not allowing, really, God to lead our lives, there will be things that are going to lead and direct us to damage ourselves and to damage other people. Let me give you a little background uh, if you're new to the series. Uh, the series itself is called Pray What? 
Because, again, Jesus has been instructing his disciples how to pray. And it's not, hey, memorize this and go through these words. It's a posture of the heart. And what, would, what do we see week one? We saw that when we pray, we're remembering who it is that we're actually talking to. So oftentimes, people just enter times of prayer because it's just a routine in their life. And so they're just really almost having a conversation with themselves because they haven't recognized that they're talking to both the infinite as well as the intimate. Right? What does Jesus say? You can talk to your, your father. There's a relationship there. There's something intimate there. But at the same time, well, he's holy. He's infinite. He's pure. He's, he's bigger. And we need to recognize that there are both of those aspects in God when we talk to him. And then Jesus gets to the heart of the prayer itself. Why do we pray? Jesus says, it's not so that you can get what you want. It's actually to surrender your will, not impose your will. And then last week, we looked at how Jesus challenged us really to talk to God about our provisions, talk to him about pardon, and today we're going to look at how we, talk, uh, how we encourage us to talk to God about our protection. And when we say, you know, give us this day our daily bread, we're, we're talking to God about more than just what we want. We're recognizing in this heart of surrender that everything we have actually is from God, that he's this good God that we can trust, that he's going to meet our needs. And as clever as we oftentimes are, and as resourceful as we oftentimes are, every single day, the only reason that we are able to take a breath into our lungs is that you're good and your wonderful God gave you that breath because that's what you need. And so we have this heart of humility when we approach him. And on top of that, you know, we receive this forgiveness. If you're a Christian today, you have, you've given your life to Christ. You've received his grace and your forgiveness. But he says, don't just, don't just receive it, extend it. To the extent that you have actually forgiven others is the extent to which God is going to forgive you. And then today, today he says, okay, let's talk. Let's, let's talk to God on a regular basis about your protection. Protection from what? If you haven't, grab your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> and in verse 13, he begins to wrap up this prayer. And he does it with protection. Protection from what? Well, notice he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There it is again, right? Jesus says, in this world, there's going to be evil. There is temptation, and if we're not recognizing this, if we're not talking to God and saying, lead me, well, then we're going to be led by other things and ever, other people that are going to cause us to do some very great damage to our lives. And so we say, God, lead, lead. I, I know that this is oftentimes tough for Christians who have gained a certain level of maturity. This is tough because we think we've mastered certain things, and then when we think we've actually mastered it, that's when it kind of sneaks up on us, and we find ourselves struggling with stuff that we thought we dealt with years ago. This happened in my life about two weeks ago. I'll share an example with you. So I walked into the bathroom that's right next to my living room, and I walked up to the toilet, and I noticed that one of my kids had not flushed the toilet, which in and of itself, not a big deal, except... Um, Except it is a big deal. And here's the thing. We taught them, it, most of you know that my kids, were, we, they were, were raised for the most part in California. And so what is California known for? The forest fires that are going on right now, right? Um, weird hippies, I guess, and some weird political leanings. Uh, and then we're also really known for the fact that we, we're just not really good with our water. And there doesn't seem to be enough rain, enough snow melt, and so there's always droughts. So we raised our kids in California to say, okay, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Why? Because we wanted to save money. We wanted to conserve on water. Otherwise, you get this crazy water bill. And so that's what we taught them. But now we're trying to teach them something new. We live in Kentucky. There's plenty of water. Just get rid of it, right? I don't care if it's yellow or brown. Just flush the thing down. So I go to this toilet. It's yellow. Ah, oh, they need to learn. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was that, yes, there was yellow in the bowl, but there was also yellow outside the bowl. For those of you who have boys in your home, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so now there's this new tension in me because as a dad, I, I recognize that messes get made. And I even express this to the boys. Yes, I, I'm, a, I'm a dude. Like, messes are made. But when messes get made, you have a responsibility to clean up those messes. And one of my kids did not clean up his mess. And so now there's this... This is rage that is beginning to develop in my heart. And so I bark out this, boys, 
<laughs> and that gets their attention, and they, you know, what, what is it, Dad? What is it? And now I'm, you know, a Gestapo, and I am trying to figure out which child was it who didn't flush and also didn't clean up. And you know what? It wasn't any of them, right? Miraculously, like, none of them even used the toilet. They started telling, Dad, I didn't even know we had a restroom off of the living room. There's a toilet in here? I had no idea. Like, none of them were going to own up to it. And so now, like, the rage is boiling over, and I just kind of let them have it, and I let them feel about this big. And now they're all cleaning up the mess. Now, you have to understand, this was the same week that I had my oral surgery, and so my, my face was puffy, uh, I was in pain, and I was on these pain meds that were just messing me up. And so as they're cleaning, and I was feeling pretty good about how I handled this situation, I started thinking, okay, I used this toilet actually about an hour ago. Is it possible that I was so out of it from the meds and the pain that I made this mess? and didn't realize that I even made the mess. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, yeah, that's, that's plausible. In fact, that's very likely what happened. And so I was a good dad. You know, what did I do? I mean, immediately I apologized. I said, guys, stop cleaning. I will clean this up for you. I, as a good, loving father who cares about their kids, I said, please forgive me. I'll never do this again. Or, or actually, like that iceberg, um, I would love to tell you, that that's how I handled the situation. But you know how I handled the situation? I didn't say a word. I just let him clean up the mess. It might have been mine. I'm pretty sure it was. But just in case it wasn't, yeah, you guys can handle it. And I, then I had yeah, this lame, like, all right, yeah, you're good boys. You're good boys. Thanks for, thanks for cleaning that up. And I just left it at that. You know, what is that, guys? What it is is we oftentimes, we, we have these things going on underneath the waterline. There's sin, there's temptation, there's evil that we can move into. And we think, yeah, I'm good. I, I'm a good dad. I love my boys. I'm such a good husband. And then these moments come and we realize, wait, there's something else at work. Maybe there's something else leading my heart. And I got to be careful about who's leading my heart. And so what does Jesus say that we need to do in order that the proper leader of our hearts is doing it on a daily basis, we begin our prayer by recognizing that we're talking to our Father who's infinite and intimate. And then we say these words, and lead us, and lead us. I know it's just three words, but this is critically important. Like we are saying, Lord, lead my family. Lord, lead this church. Lead my life. Lead me in my work environment. Lead me in my school environment. All those environments where I know sin and I know temptation, I know our, our enemy, the devil, is at work prowling around. God, you lead me. Because if, if we're not leading this or we're not asking God to lead our lives, uh, there's other things that will lead us. In fact, I just want to ask you, is God leading your life on a daily basis? Like, who's leading you? What's leading you? Are you leading you? God wants to be the one who leads you, but are you engaged in talking to him every single day to ask his leading in your life? Earlier, uh, when I was mentioning you know, some of the temptations that you might struggle with, uh, I tried to list some of the A-list celebrity you know, when it comes to uh, uh, just having the, those temptations, th those A-listers being lust, right? Um, I don't know if I mentioned that one, but maybe you struggle with lust. And if you do, guess what? That's probably a lot of you, actually. Statistically speaking, that's a big one. And then we looked at things like uh, you know, substance abuse. We, we looked at things like pride and you want to control situations, uh, overeating. Like These are the A-listers, but have you ever... Have you ever stopped and realized that every single temptation that you face, it can actually be boiled down to really one of two categories? That you say yes to temptation really in either because of self-protection, right? To protect or maybe to gratify. That protection and gratification are, are really those monsters that are underneath that waterline that really motivate us to do the things that we oftentimes do, at least that want to lead us away from God's design of how we should live our lives. Let's try to give some examples here. So think about the last time that you fell prey to sin and try to think through, okay, why did I do that? My guess is it was either to protect yourself or to gratify yourself. Maybe it was a lie. Maybe you lied. Probably not, but let's just say you did. Why did you lie? Well, I lied, Jonathan, because the story was lame. 
And I realized it halfway through the story that it was a lame story. And so I just kind of stretched it out a little bit and I put a little bit more details. And man, when I was done with the story, it wasn't quite the right story, but I got the laugh that I wanted. Gratification. That's why you lied. Well, I lied, Jonathan, because if I didn't lie, well, then I would have probably failed the exam. I, I lied because I would have been demoted. I had to lie. Okay, protection. Like, that's what motivated you to do this. See, protection and gratification, those, those are those monsters at work, underneath, in our hearts, working in our hearts. And how, some of you might even say, is that really a problem? Like, protection is important. You want to protect your life. You want to protect your self-interest, don't you? Certainly. And are there certain gratifications that just need to be met, like food and, and drink? And if you weren't, that, that'd be a problem. Certainly. But these are not meant to lead your life. God is meant to lead your life. These are poor masters, poor leaders of your life. And they will guide you into all kinds of destructive behavior. And so we pray. We pray. God, you lead. You guide this life of mine. Um, Okay, let's, let's try to process even why they have the power that they do. Um, there's typically a five-step process that gratification and self-preservation, um, they oftentimes, they'll use in order to lead you to sin. And this five-step, you'll, you'll just kind of see it, I think, naturally as I talk about it, but it begins with a thought. Like sin, sin doesn't begin with sin. Sin begins typically with a thought in your mind. You get this thought out of nowhere. And you start to entertain that thought, and that moves into imagination, where you just kind of start to, oh, yeah, that's not too bad. Or I really should, because if I don't, this, will, this bad thing will happen. And then it moves into justification. You start justifying. This isn't that big of a deal. And then it moves to the choice, and then all of a sudden, sin is birth. Let's go back to the toilet incident at the Gleason home. So when I walked in and I saw the mess next to the toilet, and it wasn't cleaned up, there was a thought that came into my mind. The thought was, I'm going to kill one of those kids. That was just a dumb little thought that came, they are going to pay. And then I started to imagine exactly what I would do. I will very systematically figure out which one did it. And when I do, ooh, I'm going to like twist it. Like I'm going to just put the pressure on. I'm going to make them feel about this big. So they'll never want to do this ever again. They'll always clean up their messes. And I've got justification on my side, right? If I've told them once, I've told them a thousand times. Clean up your mess. And besides, I'm in pain. No one's going to fault me. I'm not even behaving normally. So I, I can get a little angry, right? And then I've got this choice. And I, I run out and I yell and I get angry. And then I sprinkle on a little sin of omission just, just for good measure, right? And sin has been birthed. Some of you are like, I, I, I actually, I have little girls. So I, I don't even know what you're talking about, John. Let me give you one more example of how we see this at work. Um, imagine your temptation is fast food. But Jonathan, fast food's not sin. Okay, you're right. But let's say you had a conversation with your doctor, and your doctor said, you've got to change your eating habits. It's just not, it's not good. And so you realizing that God has given you a task and a responsibility to steward your body well, you decide no more fast food. But then Wednesday rolls around, like halfway in the work week, and it was a tough day, and you were stressed, and it was... Workday was longer than you anticipated, and now it's like, okay, I got to go home and make a meal. Man, fast food sounds really good right now. No, don't think about fast food. You've gone a whole week without fast food. Get that out of your head. But then imagination creeps in, and you start to think to yourself, okay, yeah, but like that warm bun and the savory cheese and the patty, oh my goodness, and the fries, and if I get the shake, maybe I could take the fries and dip it in the shake, and it's a sweet, savory combo, oh, right? You can, are you with me? Like the imagination, burger, fries, you guys know how this is. But again, you're trying to, you're trying to push it out of your mind. No, 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 not going to engage that. I, I've been so good. I've been so good for seven long days, and then justification creeps in. Yeah, it's actually been seven days, hasn't it? Well, that's pretty great. Normally, I eat fast food every day, sometimes multiple meals. I kind of deserve it. I mean, I've been so good, and I'm going to order the cheeseburger with the tomato slice and the lettuce. That's healthy, and I'm pretty sure potatoes are still a vegetable, and I know that they are deep frying it in vegetable oil. My goodness, this is a healthy alternative. Like, why, why wouldn't I stop off and get a burger, fries, and a shake? And so then the choice. You start thinking through, well, if I... 
If I, if I notice that the drive through isn't long, and maybe there's just one or two cars, I'll go ahead and stop. And, and I'll go ahead and, and maybe get the meal. And sure enough, there's just one or two cars. And so not only that, but you see a sign that says, buy one meal and get another free. Guys, if this is not a sign from Lord, the Lord himself, right, then, then what is? And so you pull in and you, you don't just eat one meal, like you eat two meals. You guys see how quickly like, this desire for gratification and oftentimes protection and this step-by-step -step approach that we see that might actually happen in a matter of seconds. Sometimes it takes minutes, sometimes it takes days, sometimes it takes years for this sin to, to actually give, give birth to itself. But this is what happens. And if you allow, if you allow protection and gratification to begin leading in your life, you're going to start asking yourself a question. The question you're going to start asking yourself at some point is, why am I here? What is my purpose in life? Right? That's the question that every poet, every philosopher, every songwriter has asked at some point in their life. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Some of you might even think that's not a problem. But there's a better question. And the better question is, who am I here for? See, the better question is, who am I here for? Because what does protection and gratification try to convince you? They try to convince you that the best life that you can live is a life for yourself. The best life that you can live is a life lived for yourself. So gratify whatever you want, whatever craving you have. Protect yourself at all costs. This is a better way of life. If you don't know this by now, a life lived for yourself is no life at all. And some of you, you're shaking your head and you're saying, that's right, because you've been down that road and you try to live for gratification and self-preservation and you realize you just left yourself wanting more. And others of you, you have not figured it out yet and you're still living your life for yourself. Let me try to give you some encouragement. If you're still thinking, well, that might be the best way to live your life, think about the stories in your life that move you. They may be fictional stories or they may be true stories. My guess is that for all of us, the stories that truly move our hearts, that move our souls, that cause us maybe even to tear up, they're the, they're the stories that are not actually about self-preservation. They're not about someone who just wants to seek gratification in life, but the individual who answered the question, who am I here for? And they put those things aside to live for something, oftentimes someone, higher than themselves. These are stories that move us like, like the example of Jesus when, when he was talking about this woman who has just a couple of pennies to her name and she takes these pennies. This is all she has. And she hoards it. Protection, right? She spends it on herself, some food, so, so that she can gratify her hunger. She doesn't do that. What does she do? She takes it and in an act of worship, she gives it to God. Our hearts are moved by this. Why? Because it it speaks to this greed that sometimes we convince ourselves is a better way to live life. But then when we hear those stories, it begins to crack and shatter that, that paradigm in us. And we realize, okay, maybe this is better. Or it's those, those stories of individuals who start asking that question, who, who am I here to live for? And they start answering that question and it moves them actually to engage in, in acts of charity that actually may help people out of slavery, uh, may help uh, those who are in drug addiction to actually overcome drug addiction. Uh, who am I here for? These are the people that, that tackle big issues and they give up their life in order to solve these problems. And our hearts are moved by these people. And you look at them and say, my gosh, that is a life lived well. Not about protection, not about gratification. It's even in our fiction um, I'll give you an example. So one of the things that we like to do as a family, if we have a long drive to make that drive not feel quite as long, is uh, Dana will read a book to us, which is really nice. I get a drive, boys are dialed in, not arguing with each other, and we get to read a nice book. And so a couple, probably about a month ago at this point, um, she was reading The Hunger Games. We were on a long drive, and so she was reading the book Hunger Games. I've already read the book. I enjoyed the book. She read the book already. Uh, the boys hadn't, and so she's reading it. If you've read the book, it's a story, uh, it's the part, part of the story where this young girl named Prim is, her name is actually selected out of hundreds of other names to represent her district 
in games that will most certainly take her life. And as soon as her name has been read, her older sister, Katniss, who deeply loves Prim, before she even realizes she knows what she's doing, she's raising her hand, she's rushing the stage, and she's shouting, I volunteer as tribute. Meaning she will most certainly die in these games. But she's willing to do it for her sister, who she loves. And so the boys are listening, my wife's reading, I'm driving, and you know what else I'm trying to do? I'm trying to hold back tears as best as I can. Because I've already read this book. I knew what was coming. But when it starts talking about Prim and Katniss, I'm like, oh, yeah, no. Th- there was a bug that kind of flew in. And, like, I don't even, don't look at me, boys. Don't look at me, right? Like, that's, that's where I'm at. Why? What's going on in my heart? Some of you are like, I know what's going on. You are a total sissy, Jonathan. That's, that's what the reality is here. You're probably right. But you know there's more to it, isn't there? There's just something in our hearts that are moved not by gratification, not by people who just are looking to protect themselves, but are willing to actually actually give up that protection. People like Jesus, who are able to see the great need in humanity and actually pay that price that we could not pay. And I don't know if you've ever been at a point in your life where maybe you asked, maybe you made the statement, There must be more to life than this. Have you ever been there? It's typically not a question that young kids ask or or, or a statement, I should say, that kids ask. It's usually after we chase protection and we chase gratification over and over and over again and we obtain a safe little world where we seem to have everything that we really wanted and then we look at everything that we have and we say, is this all there is? And you know what we're really saying when we make those statements? We're saying there must be more to life than just me. And you're right. There is more to life than just you. There's a better question that we need to ask, and the question is, who who am I to live for? And Jesus answers this question over and over and over again in this prayer. Like, who are you to live your life for? Our Father in heaven. Holy is your name. Who are we to live our life for? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who are we to live our life for? Give us this day our daily bread. You are the one that sustains us. Who are we to live our life for? Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have done wrong and evil towards us. As who do we live for? And lead us. Lead us, Lord. Lead us, God, out of temptation, out from underneath the power of the evil one. Lead us into your hope. You know, the daily rhythm of our lives, I think, needs to reflect this heart of prayer. We begin by recognizing who it is that we're talking to. And then we pray this prayer of surrender. And even in the midst of leadership, we say, God, you lead my life. Because there are paths that we can take and we can allow all kinds of things and all kinds of people to lead our life, but God is the only one who will lead our life well. And so we pray, lead us. Lead us away from temptation. Is this a matter of, you know, you just trying harder? I've got this temptation. I've got this sin in my life. It just means I need to try harder. I need to have, you know, more self-discipline. Those things may help, but that's not the heart of it. You know, the heart of it is saying, God, you lead. And Jesus says, Over and over again in the Gospels, follow me, follow me, follow me. Is that the path that we're on? See, we can pray. We can pray, Lord, lead my life. And when we do, we cannot pray that prayer and simultaneously allow the leadership of protection and gratification. We can't. Or if we do, you know what that makes us? That makes you a hypocrite. And I don't think any of you want to be hypocrites. And so we pray, you lead us, Lord. And at the end of Jesus' teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, right there in the middle is this prayer. At the end of his sermon, what does he say? He says, if you hear these words of mine and you decide not to put it into practice, you're like an individual who builds their home on sand. And when the tide comes in, it's going to be too late to pray. When the weather of life happens, it's going to be too late to pray. And so what do we do as a church? What do we do as Christians? Is we pray on earth, not just in heaven. We pray now and we say, Lord, 
you lead my life so that temptation and sin will not drag me down. Some of you, you've got some real sin. You've got some real temptation in your life. And maybe this is actually a sermon that's kind of disappointing to you. Because as we were talking about temptation, you were hoping for maybe like a four-step approach to never struggle with temptation again. And I've just kind of boiled this down to, hey, allow God to lead your life. Follow Jesus. And you're like, ugh, I need more than that. Let me give you some encouragement if that's where you're at. There, I don't know if you're familiar with Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther, kind of the, the father of the Reformation movement. Um, he says, if you want to be a great theologian, if you want to be someone, somebody who loves God, who's close to God, you really need three things. Martin Luther said this, what you're going to need is you're going to need prayer, you're going to need meditation, and get this, he says, you're going to need temptation. Huh? What was that last one? You're going to need temptation? Yeah, he says, you're going to need prayer. You need to have a conversation with your father. You're going to need to actually meditate, which is this idea of listening to the father and being led by the father. And you're going to need temptation, which is depending on your father. So we've got an enemy that thinks he can use temptation to draw us away from the father. But God says, I can use anything to draw you closer to me. I can even use temptation because what does that do? That causes you to lean on me and my leadership all the more. And so this is what we pray. And this is what we challenge you guys to be praying. Lord, lead me. I want to be on that path where you're guiding me away from temptation and into your glory. And so would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us, Lord, and lead us away from temptation, away from our enemy and evil into your presence. We pray this in your son Jesus' name.